So we will look at uh, differential gene expression analysis and also enrichment analysis. So of course, once we have identified different cell types, now we are happy with our clustering. We have decided which clusters we want to keep. We want to start seeing which are the genes that are differentially expressed between uh, different conditions, but also maybe uh, identify marker genes that are more expressed in one cell type compared to the other. And then once we have a list of genes, we want to start to annotate them and see what functions they're involved in. So we'll do enrichment analysis. So first for the marker gene identification, <clears throat> the implementation is SURAT, in SURAT is used towards a function which is called find all markers. And this by default will use a Wilcoxon test to detect genes that are markers for cell clusters or cell types. Basically what you will do, so for example, you have five clusters of cells in your data set or five cell types you will use find markers to find the marker genes that are more expressed in one of the clusters against all other cells. So for example, if you're interested to see what are the genes that are more expressed in cluster zero compared to the rest of your data set, you can use this find all markers function. So it's really taking one cluster against all other cells. And it does this for all of your clusters. So cluster zero against all other, cluster one against all others, etc. You will see if you look at the help that you have the option to only output the genes that are upregulated in one cluster or to include both. So of course you can also have genes that are less expressed in one of the cluster compared to the rest of the cells. Then there is another um, function which is uh, very similar it's called find markers and this is to perform pairwise comparison of genes so here it's not taking one cluster against all others it's taking one against another so specifically two clusters it's really a pairwise comparison so between cluster one and clusters two uh, here the default is also using the wilcoxon test and their other uh, possibilities, you can have a look at the help to see what other methods are implemented. So as we have seen already- Can yes, I just we, add something? Yes, you yes. could also find markers compare one cluster versus three others, for instance. Yes. But it's, a, it's two comparisons that you will do. Exactly, yes. So every time you, for example, if you want to compare cluster one against cluster two and cluster one against cl cluster three, you will have to run two comparisons. So running these comparisons twice that you can do. It's just for you to know it's only pairwise. So we have seen uh, already yesterday and the day before that for a single cell uh, data analysis, Every time you want to uh, do a task, several options are available. And of course, this is also the case for differential gene expression analysis. And this is uh, one paper that is, can be quite interesting. It is from 2018, but I think it's still uh, valid. And um, here it's an evaluation of 36 methods that can be used for differential gene expression analysis in a single cell data. So if you're familiar with bulk uh, RNA-seq data analysis, at the beginning of the single cell uh, data generation, people would use methods that were designed even for microarrays like Lima or for bulk RNA-seq like DSEC, uh, applied on single cell RNA-seq data. And then there were some new methods developed uh, specifically for single cell data. And in this paper, the authors compared actually these methods. So using the bulk methods and also comparing some of the single cell methods and see uh, which could be, um, you know, the most ap appropriate. And I think they used simulated data uh, to see how the methods would recover the truly differentially expressed genes. And uh, one of the interesting figures in that article is this one. And here on the rows, we have 
all the different methods that they uh, tested and they had uh, several metrics here in the columns that were evaluated for each method. So I'm not going to discuss them all, but we'll have a look maybe at uh, some that could be interesting, like scalability or speed or complex design. So um, here, some of the methods maybe uh, are familiar to you. So for example, the t-test, and this it can be used in any uh, analysis of any type of data. So not only bulk RNA-seq or single cell, but also any type of data. And we can see that <clears throat> in all of the um, metrics, it performs quite well, except for complex design. And that means that when you have a t-test, it's really a pairwise comparison. So like you have two groups, control and treated, for example, and you want to compare. In this case, it, it will be totally fine. You could use a t-test. On the other hand, if you have a more complex design, like suddenly you will have batch effects or you have like, I don't know, for example, uh, uh, five, dif uh, five different experimental groups where you had different combinations of, of, dr of drugs, for example, a factorial design, then of course t-test is not going to be uh, applied on a more complex design. Um, there are other methods that perform uh, very well and and so for example edge r edge r is a method also designed for bulk rna seq data and within edge r you have several um, methods uh, of analysis and here would be the one that they found as the top rank ranking and there is another one also mast i think that was developed specifically for single cell rna seq and then um, there is another uh, tool which is called lima which was uh, designed for at the beginning for microarray data analysis and it's also used a lot for bulk rna seq analysis and one that i often use for example is the vum lima uh, method and we can see that it's ranking at the top here so during the exercises you'll be able to test uh, vum lima and uh, in terms of uh, scalability, so this is something also important to take into account um, that some methods uh, do not scale very well. So the more cells you have, the slower it will be, and also for the speed. Um, the nice thing about this paper is that the authors um, made available all of the code to run all of these uh, methods. So if, for example, you would want to test the edge RR QLFD uh, method, you could uh, have a look at the GitHub repository for that paper, and you have the R script uh, that you can uh, take the code from and uh, apply it to your data. So it's really a nice resource if you're not familiar with these packages, for example, also DSEC2, we use a lot for bulk RNA-seq. Uh, you could also have a look at the methods there in these R scripts. All right, so um, describing the figure of the paper, I described these Lima or Edge R packages. So as I said, these are methods uh, that were designed for microarray or bulk RNA-seq. And the nice thing is that we can include uh, complex designs. So if we have a batch effect, for example, uh, we can include it in our model as a covariant. And this we will uh, test in the exercise, uh, including the donor ID um, as a covariant uh, using Lima. Of course, you can use uh, also these uh, packages to analyze factorial design. So if you have a combination of genotype per treatment, uh, you can uh, easily use Lima and specify the interaction, for example, in the model. So here is another approach at looking at uh, differences in gene expression across different cell types, for example. And uh, this is called a uh, meta cell. And so here you have the link to the paper. And here they applied, for example, to CD8 T cells. 
So here, what it does here, we have um, a dimensional reduction uh, um, image of some uh, uh, immune cells that were classified according to their different uh, functionalities or like if they're dysfunctional or if they're more memory, etc. And the idea is that the authors wanted to see if there was a relationship between um, an expression score for a cytotoxic uh, like pathway, uh, comparing it to the expression score of a dysfunctional uh, pathway. So if you try to calculate the score as we did yesterday with add module score and create a scatter plot on the with x, y uh, axis, since the single cell data is sparse, for example, you probably will see uh, quite a lot of noise if you look at that at the single cell level. And even more if you plot one gene against the, the other. So if you're interested in checking what could be the correlation of expression between gene A and gene B, if you create a plot like that, you will see a lot of noise. So to sort of reduce that noise and trying to obtain a better uh, correlations that are a bit cleaner, the idea here is to aggregate uh, several cells into what is called a meta cell. So for example, you take like 20 to 50 cells and you create like an aggregate of their gene expression. And so the noise that is within each will be sort of uh, corrected for. So here, this is what we have here uh, represented. So here, every dot is like the aggregate expression of several cells. And you do that for your different cell types. So you have these uh, dysfunctional in dark purple and light purple transitional and the yellow cytotoxic. So you can see now that you have kind of a much cleaner um, inverse correlation between these two scores and like the transitional or in the middle. So this can be a nice approach to sort of clean up your, your correlations and have uh, clearer views. So that's another approach that you can use for looking at G different differential gene expression or different uh, scores among your cells. So now, um, Many people uh, use, uh, for example, uh, find markers to look at differential gene expression between a control group and a treated group. So let's say here we have um, healthy donor A and a patient. So we have two conditions, healthy and patient. And we have found that we have one cell type X of interest. So patient A has 98 cells and patient uh, A here, uh, well, healthy donor A has 98 cells and the patient has 105 cells. And so uh, maybe sometimes you can try to look at differential gene expression analysis between healthy and patient by using find markers, uh, using all these cells against all these cells. But imagine that the fact that all of these cells come from the same, same patient, they're actually not really independent. So you have to ask yourself the question, how many independent replicates do you have? And this is something uh, that is considered a lot in more like ecology. So for example, if you would like to compare the number of species between forest and grassland ecosystem, if you choose one forest and one grassland and sample several spots in each, and so you just compare, you just run a statistical test to compare the species between forest A and, for, and grassland. So forest A, you think you have three replicates and grassland you have four, but actually how many real independent replicates do you have? And in this case, forest A should rather be considered as one replicate and grassland A should be considered as one biological replicate. And so you go to another site and then you compare again another forest to another grassland. And of course, you can um, evaluate many spots within each ecosystem, but conceptually, each uh, site is a different independent replicate. 
And so we can compare like donors or uh, individuals like individual mice as being the actual independent replicates. So in this case, instead of having like 200 cells of each, we actually have two independent replicates in each condition. And so what we will do to compare the differential gene expression between healthy condition and patient is to aggregate the gene expression for each patient to have one representative value for each uh, independent replicate. And this can be done using a package which is called MOSCAT, which will do pseudo bulk analysis. So here we have our uh, healthy donor A. We found 98 cells of cell type X, and we create a pseudo bulk uh, of the gene expression profile for the cell in this donor. So now we have one replicate. And we do the same for the healthy donor B where we found 87 cells, for example, of cell type X, we have one uh, replicate for this. So now we have two independent replicates for each condition. And if you have several cell types in your experiment, so in each patient, you, you didn't only uh, evaluate one cell type, but uh, for example, all these, so you had B cells, monocytes, etc. So you will, uh, here we have two conditions, control and stimulated, for example. So you will obtain one uh, pseudo bulk per patient, per cell type, uh, per condition. So here, for example, you can see that we have this FCGR3A monocytes that were aggregated. We had several patients. So for example, for the stimulated here, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, donors. And then we have the same here in the control. So the same cells and also one um, pseudo bulk for every cell type for every uh, donor. And after you obtain these aggregated gene expression per cell type per donor, you can use, for example, a dimensionality reduction. So this is uh, something similar to a PCA, for example. And then you can start to see if your conditions uh, sort of diverge or not, and how the cell type, where they're located in the dimensional reduction space. Then you can, of course, perform differential gene expression analysis, uh, taking each donor as the independent replicate. And here we have an example, for example, of two genes that were differentially expressed in one of the cell types between control and stimulated. And of course, then you're free to go back to your single cell data and create a violin plot of, this, of these two genes within each cell. So here is going back to the single cell representation, showing in the single cell how this gene is distributed uh, across donors, across the single cell of each donor in each condition. And you can, of course, create a heat map also at the donor level. So here we have some of the genes that were differentially expressed between the conditions, and you have control and stimulated for one of the cell type, for example, for B cells. And these sort of figures uh, you can create using this package, uh, MOSCAT, and also the uh, aggregation of the uh, so the creation of the pseudo bulk uh, for every cell type for every patient, you can do with functions uh, of the MOSCAT package. All right, so that was it for the background. So the question is to determine whether some genes are differentially expressed among cells coming from any of three groups, such as cells from newborn mice, middle-aged mice, or old, old mice. Which functions or methods would you use? So I haven't mentioned the F test, but this is basically like an ANOVA uh, that you can do uh, when you have more than two groups that is implemented in Lima package, or the find markers uh, function from Surat, which does pairwise comparisons, or the T test.
One more second. Okay. <clears throat> ah, good. I'm glad to see the the <clears throat> the message mostly came through. So basically, if you have three groups, uh, if you're working in a setting outside of single cell RNA seq, you would probably use an, an ANOVA or a F test, and you could if you have bulk RNA-seq, for example, <clears throat> or in this case, single cell, you could use F-test implemented in Lima, which is like an ANOVA, which will tell you uh, for every gene if it is different in any of the three groups. So after you run an ANOVA, you could run a post hoc test to see which groups differ um, in terms of gene expression. If you use find markers, so that could also be an option, but you would have to compare one group against each other. And when you do that, you you may be uh, overestimate, so you don't correct uh, completely uh, the p-value because of the multiple uh, comparison issue. And when you do an F-test implemented in Lima, for example, this is already uh, dealt with usually. With the fine markers, you would have group one against group two, and then you adjust the p-value only within this comparison. So maybe you would have to further manually adjust for the multiple comparisons that you're doing. And then finally, a t-test you cannot really use because here we have three groups and t-test could only be uh, used for like comparing newborn to middle age, but again, um, that's not what we want. We want to see if any of the three groups differ. All right. So once we have identified differentially expressed genes, what do we do? So I'm sure that if you have performed any bulk RNA-seq or even single cell RNA-seq before, you always end up with a long list of differentially expressed genes, sometimes hundreds of genes. And maybe you know what a few of them do, but how do you know what all of them do? So the idea is to gain biologically meaningful insights from long list of genes. And this is where we do enrichment analysis. And of course, several methods are uh, available. And two that I will discuss are the overrepresentation analysis or ORA and the gene set enrichment analysis or GSEA. You can have uh, different approaches to using these two methods. So first is if you have a particular expectation of what should be going on in your system. So for example, if you knock out a transcription factor that is involved in a pathway, you could have a look specifically if this, the genes that are involved in this pathway are enriched in your list of differential gene expression analysis or not. So you could just uh, go ahead and uh, test if this particular condition is enriched. The other approach is if you don't have uh, an expectation and just want to see um, functionally what your differential, differentially ex expressed genes are doing, you could test a number of a large uh, number of gene sets uh, to see if you find interesting functions or new functions that you didn't expect. And you could test these gene sets or pathways that you found in collections on, on online. And I will show you uh, some, some ideas. So what is a gene set? And it can be, of course, many things. It can be the genes working together in a pathway. So here we have the citric acid cycle. And at each step, you have an enzyme involved. And so, of course, you can see if the um, genes that code for these enzymes are differentially expressed or not in your system. <clears throat> so, of course, a gene set could be all genes involved in a pathway, or it could be all genes located in the same compartment in a cell. For example, you want to see if all the proteins that are usually located in the nucleus could be uh, differentially affected by your condition. Uh, you could see if the proteins that are regulated by a, a same transcription factor are affected. So again, if you knock out the transcription factor, 
And if you have a list of target chain of this transcription factor, are these differentially expressed or not? Uh, then you could, of course, um, compile your own gene set by using a custom list that you found in a publication. So let's say you found an interesting publication of uh, genes downregulated in a mutant. You could see if in your uh, setting, you also see an enrichment for these genes um, in your system. If you're working on diseases, uh, you could, of course, um, look if a list of genes that contain a SNP associated with this disease are also differentially expressed, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really not like a fixed uh, thing. It's not just the gene that are involved in pathway, but it's any uh, list of gene that do something together or are linked in some way. And in terms of where to find gene sets, if you don't have any uh, as previous knowledge, you can find some that are grouped in uh, knowledge bases or in databases online. One such example is the gene ontology. So it's a consortium uh, who try to um, uh, develop a comprehensive uh, model of biological systems. So you can uh, find uh, gene sets that are linked to the um, molecular functions at the organism level, and they try to include a multiplicity of species in the tree of life. It's one of the, I think it's the biggest uh, knowledge base in terms of uh, information on the function of genes. And uh, it is uh, organized in what they call different ontologies, so different type of processes. One is called the biological processes. So here it's more um, linked in terms of uh, maybe a bit more pathways and uh, function of genes. So uh, specifically biological processes in the cell. Then you have the cellular components, so more where the different proteins and uh, gene products are located in a cell. And then you have the molecular uh, functions also. So you could have genes that have a similar like DNA binding domain, for example, and all of these um, genes that have this similar binding domain or sort of a uh, similar enzymatic uh, functioning, they would be grouped in a gene set uh, of all of these genes under the molecular functions ontology. So the gene ontology uh, gene sets are sort of organized hierarchically. At the top, for example, here is one sort of tree. You have one gene set that is called metabolic process. And for every gene set, you have what is called a, a go term. So it's like a number or an identity. So you have the name, it's metabolic process, and here is the, the ID. And since it's at the top of the hierarchy, this gene set is very big. So you can have like 2000 genes, for example. So at the top of the tree, the gene sets are very big. And as you go down, they become more and more uh, specific and specialized. So here at the bottom, we could have a very small gene set, maybe could have like 20 genes, and it's very uh, specialized and specific, and it's called Hexos Biosynthetic Process. And it has its, its name and also its uh, ID. And then you can see, so it's not always exclusive. Some uh, gene sets can share uh, genes with uh, several other uh, gene sets. And this, uh, it, this creates the fact that some of the gene sets are a bit redundant. So you can have overlap of gene content among different gene sets. So if you run an enrichment analysis and find several of these gene sets that are significantly enriched, then it's probably because some of the genes that are differentially expressed are shared among several uh, of these go terms. So other sources of gene sets, if you don't have any previous um, expectation or want to browse a bit what type of functions you have enriched in your data set, um, here you can find um, some online resources. 
So there is the molecular signature database or MCDB. It contains several types of uh, gene set lists and collections. So it includes access to the gene ontology gene sets, but it also contains, for example, a hallmark. And these are 50 uh, gene sets that were uh, compiled by the authors of the gene set enrichment analysis method that I will describe a bit uh, later. And these are sort of well-known gene sets. So they're mostly, I would say they mostly apply to human and mouse. Uh, but they're well-known gene sets and well annotated and curated. So it can be interesting to have a look at these. And then in MCDB, you also have access to published gene sets. So, so there you can download a list of uh, gene sets that come from publications that are all linked to, for example, um, oncology or other types. I think now they have COVID also, but I'd have to check. So every time you have a publication that uh, describes some genes that are involved in oncology, for example, it can be added to this collection. Then there is the CAG uh, database. And this one um, mostly is uh, linked uh, and includes uh, mostly pathways as we understand them. Like for example, the citric acid cycle or other type of pathways. And one thing I like is that they have these um, images of uh, how the genes are organized. So maybe we can have a look if I show you this. Let's see, whoops. So uh, the good thing about KEG is that it doesn't only include human and mouse, but you can have a, a whole list of different uh, organisms. And if you want to search in, um, in, in um, KEG, uh, you need to uh, have like an abbreviation of your species. So for example, if you're working with Arabidopsis, for example, you have it included here, Arabidopsis, uh, two species or other uh, species are also uh, present, so you even lemur and yeah, other <laughs> species. Now let's have a look at human still. So for human, you have HSA, which is uh, the abbreviation in keg, and then you can, uh, for example, type. Uh, uh, let's see if we can find the cytokine pathway. Yes. For example, a signaling pathway in human. So you can have access to these uh, maps here and see what are the uh, genes that are upstream, what are the genes that are downstream. So I think it's quite interesting to have a look at these uh, uh, keg pathways if, if you're not familiar with, and it can give you some ideas um, whether you, they would be interesting for you to use or not. So this you can actually access also directly the list of all of these uh, CAG pathways uh, for human, I think, uh, in MCDB. Then there is another database which is called the Reactome, and there they try to classify the genes uh, in terms of their, um, um, for example, reactions, enzymatic reactions, or other type of reactions, and how they interact. So each of these uh, collections um, are compiled by a consortium of people uh, that work towards uh, one type of uh, classification of, of um, the genes. So Reactome is one, and there is the Wiki Pathway. And Wiki Pathways is a bit like uh, Wikipedia, where anyone can suggest a pathway and um, make modifications. So it's more of a public uh, effort to try to uh, put genes together in terms of pathways. So these are a few that you can um, access directly uh, from the MCDB uh, web page. So here I would like to uh, describe how the enrichment analysis works. 
And the idea is that, so here we can have, for example, um, several uh, donors that are healthy and some patients, and uh, we uh, measure the expression of several genes. And then we have some uh, genes that are part of a pathway that we're interested in. We call it the blue gene set. And we want to see if these genes are uh, enriched in our differential gene expression results or not. So one option could be to sort these genes based on full change. And so we have some genes that are downregulated and others that are upregulated. And then we can uh, see whether our blue genes are rather uh, located at the top or at the bottom of this uh, sorted uh, list. And this will tell us if the genes are enriched at the bottom or at the top, that means maybe our pathway is enriched. So for uh, the enrichment uh, analysis method, that's the overrepresentation um, analysis. Uh, we actually look at the proportion of genes that are um, actually differentially expressed or not, and that are part of our pathway or not. And then we use a Fisher's exact test that here is an example of uh, how it works in, in R. So there is an R function, which is called Fisher test where you could uh, run a Fisher test for any type of data, as long as you have a count matrix. So what you have to count here is an example of this uh, little um, code here. We create a contingency table of uh, the counts of the differentially expressed genes. Uh, so here we have two that are differentially expressed and that are part of our blue gene set of interest and five that are differentially expressed, but they're not part of our blue gene set. And then we have some genes that are not differentially expressed that can also be part of the blue gene set and 12 that are not differentially expressed and not part of the blue gene set. So the idea of the Fisher test is to see if this proportion two out of seven is um, different from this proportion three out of 15. And um, here, if we run the Fisher test on our contingency table, this is the output that we will obtain. So first, the odds ratio uh, will tell you uh, whether this proportion is bigger or smaller than this one. So if it's um, higher than one, then this proportion is bigger. If it's lower than one, this proportion is uh, bigger. Then you, you can have a look at the confidence interval for your odds ratio. And here we see that um, the confidence interval includes one. So basically uh, we can expect that um, our odds ratio is not significant. And indeed, if we have a look at the p-value, it's uh, one. So basically here we don't have an over-representation of our blue gene set among the differentially expressed genes. And uh, so this is how it works in R. Um, if you, um, so in the example that I just showed, we were testing if one uh, gene set of interest, the blue one was overrepresented in the differentially expressed genes. But of course, if you decide to test a collection of gene sets, for example, all of the pathways that are included in the CAG database, then you could run individual Fisher exact tests for each gene set. So you would run one for the green gene set, one for the pink gene set, one for the blue, et cetera. Once you uh, obtain a p-value for every gene set, since you run multiple tests, you need to adjust for the uh, multiple testing issue. And so you adjust the p-value. Um, this you will see when we do in the exercises, we use, we use a package which is called cluster profiler, which has a function that allows you to uh, run multiple Fisher tests for several gene sets at once. So basically the way that you run this um, analysis is by providing the list of 
differentially expressed genes that you had and the list of genes that were not differentially expressed. And then you provide your collection of gene sets that you want to test. And in the output, you will obtain a list of all of the gene sets that were significantly enriched. And the p-value will already be adjusted for the multiple comparisons. So you will see it's quite uh, easy to, to do. Um, one limitation of the Fisher test is that it's threshold based. So basically what I mean by that is that each gene is classified as either a sort of black and white classification. The gene is either differentially expressed or not. And um, this doesn't take into consideration the magnitude of the fold change. So here we have three genes that were classified as being downregulated. But this gene is much more than regulated than uh, gene number nine, for example. And the same for the upregulation. So there is another uh, analysis that actually allows you to take into account the magnitude of uh, the fold change of the genes that are differentially expressed. And this is the gene set enrichment analysis method that I will discuss just uh, um, afterwards. So I just already mentioned this cluster profiler package. So of course, it is one possibility among uh, several other packages to do enrichment analysis. But uh, why I like it is that it um, these functions are more or less easy to use. And it has also um, a nice uh, tutorial online. So you can see, have a look at the vignette. And it has a built-in access to gene sets for human, mouse, yeast, and even other organisms. And um, you can have access to uh, gene ontology, for example, and KEG. It also has a visualization function. So once you have generated an, uh, an enrichment analysis using cluster profiler, the object that you create, you can use in functions uh, to create like uh, bar plots or dot plots of p-values, et cetera, directly with the cluster profiler package. So it can do um, several things, which is quite nice. Uh, the only uh, maybe difficult uh, part of cluster profiler is to understand the arguments of the functions. So um, I wanted to take a moment to explain a little bit uh, what are the arguments of the uh, cluster profiler functions. So um, this is the function of the Fisher test. That's a pa part of the stats package. So it's the one I just described before. You have many arguments uh, uh, possible. And so um, the important one is X, which is the contingency table that you have pro to provide. And uh, maybe the alternative um, to either if you have, if you don't have an expectation of whether um, your proportion should be higher or lower, you can run a two-sided uh, Fisher test. But if you have an expectation, you can either choose greater, for example, and so these are maybe the two options that you can choose in Fisher test. Now for um, uh, cluster profiler functions. So here's an example of one of the function, which is called enrich go. And this allows you to perform an overrepresentation analysis. So it's like a Fisher test uh, implementation in cluster profiler. Uh, and the format, as you can see, is quite different from the Fisher test function because you don't provide a contingency table. You provide just the list of genes that were significantly differentially expressed in this gene argument. Then you have to uh, give uh, an argument which corresponds to the species with which you are working with. And this orgdb, actually, this will call a package which are uh, called orgdb packages on Bioconductor, which are like uh, gene annotation uh, packages for several species. So if you want to run cluster profiler for human or mouse or other species, 
you have to install the orgdb package in R first. And then in this argument, you just provide the name of your orgdb package that has to be used to uh, find the correct uh, gene annotations. Then you have another argument, which is called uh, key type, which will actually uh, be needed to inform the function how the genes are labeled in our gene argument. So a gene can be labeled according to a symbol, but also, for example, ensemble ID or other type of IDs. You can even have uniprots if you work on proteomics. You could have uh, enzyme ID even. And the idea here is to um, tell the function how your genes are labeled here. So if you use a symbol, then you can change this key type to symbol. Then for the ontology, so I have described to you that the gene ontology is organized in three ontologies, the biological processes, the cellular uh, components, and the molecular functions. So um, here is the argument where you can select which ones you want to test. So for example, if it's here, it's the molecular functions that is selected. Um, then for the p-value cutoff, this is um, the um, uh, for the output actually of the results. Do you want to output only the significant uh, gene sets or all of them? So by default, it outputs only the significant one because the p-value is at 0 0.05. But if you want to uh, output all, even the non-significant, maybe that can happen. You can change the p-value cutoff to one, for example. Then I told you about this multiple correction uh, step that has to be done once you test several gene sets at once. And this is uh, performed directly by the enrich go function. And the adjustment method is the benjamini Hochberg one. And this, of course, if you have uh, knowledge about different methods, you can change. You could use, for example, the Bonferroni correction if you only test like five gene sets. So that's uh, one of the options. And then the universe. So um, the function uh, needs a way to know which are the non-significant genes in your data set. So you provide the list of gene symbols that were not significant as the universe argument. Uh, finally, the minimum gene set size and maximum gene set size. Um, so in some collections of gene sets, uh, some gene sets can be very small. So I think in the Go uh, collection, some are less than 10. So we're not necessarily interested in testing for the small gene sets. So we put a limit on at 10. And the same for the maximum gene set size. Um, I told you that some gene sets in the gene ontology are uh, very long. They have thousands of genes inside. And so maybe uh, they're not that interesting because they're very general. So we put also a maximum set size threshold of 500. But that's, of course, up to you to decide if you want to change these. Now there is another function which is called enricher. And this uh, arguments are very similar to the one I just described to enrich go. But this one you can use for a, a list of gene sets that you defined on your own. So if you compiled a list of gene sets from several publications, and want to perform overrepresentation analysis for all of your 10 gene sets, for example, you could use the enricher function. The first arguments are the same as I just described. And there is an additional uh, argument that's called term to gene that is actually a data frame that contains um, the list of your um, gene sets. So you have 10 gene sets, each one will have a name, maybe with the author of the publication where you found it. And we'll also have for every gene set, the list of genes that it contains. So this is a data frame that is formatted as two columns that you have to provide to this function. And then the output will be very similar. You have the list of significant gene sets, you have the p-value for each 
um, et cetera. So with cluster profiler, you can do a visualization of your um, results. So here you can see, I have a small example where we performed an, an overrepresentation analysis of the gene ontology gene sets. So the, we generate an object that's called ego. So then the format of this object is specific to the cluster profiler package. And actually you can directly use this object with some visualization function. And here, for example, is a dot plot of our results. And we show, for example, 10 uh, significant gene sets. And here is an example. So you have the different gene sets and the dot is colored according to the P value. So you can see which are the most significant among all. Then the size of the dot is proportional to the number of genes that were significantly um, differentially expressed and that were part of the gene set. And finally, on the x-axis, there is something that is called gene ratio, and it's linked to actually the proportion that these genes represent. So out of it, it's, it's not exactly the same information because if you have 10 genes in a gene set of 100 genes, it's not going to be the same proportion as if you have 10 genes in a gene set of 20 genes, for example. So here we have this proportion that is represented. So 10 out of 100 or 10 out of 20, for example. So you have this on the X axis. Then another uh, representation that could be uh, interesting is the enrichment map. And for example, I told you in the gene ontology uh, collection, some gene sets are maybe a bit redundant and they overlap in terms of gene content. And if you create an enrichment map, you can start to have a look at the bigger picture of the type of uh, functions or gene sets that are significant in your data set. So here again, we run an overrepresentation analysis providing our differentially expressed genes. And we use the emap plot function, which will create this um, enrichment map. Here, the link actually shows um, that these genes share a gene content, these gene sets share some gene content. So all of these gene sets are uh, sharing some genes. So they might be all linked, as we can see here, to some sort of cancer um, um, gene sets. And then we have some other uh, gene sets here, more viral or disease linked. And so you can start to see sort of uh, what's happening at the bigger picture. So maybe cancer related gene sets, disease related gene sets were uh, significant in my differentially expressed genes. And then you have some that are more unique. This one, for example, doesn't share any genes with the others. Another uh, tool that I put here is called Revigo. And um, this is a website where you can actually uh, enter a list of Go terms. So all of these uh, gene ontology gene sets will have a go term associated to each one. So you can uh, put the list of go terms on Revigo and it will create also a map a bit similar to that, but the approach is different. It's the, it will do a dimensional uh, reduction uh, analysis of the list of gene sets that you provide and put them in a 2D representation according to their gene content similarity. And also on Revigo, once you have created the plot, you can actually download the R code uh, to regenerate the same plot in R. And if you want to customize it uh, with like changing colors, etc., you can do it easily. So it's also a nice tool to, to try out. All right, um, now I will describe the gene set enrichment analysis method. So I will um, try to explain it uh, so that you can understand more or less how it works. 
Um, this one can be performed if you have uh, some sort of statistical value for all genes that were detected in your single cell RNA-seq data set. So in the previous uh, overrepresentation analysis, I showed you that you just provide the list of significant genes and that this method is threshold based. So you just have a gene that is significant or not, and you sort of ignore the full change. This analysis, the overrepresentation analysis, you can do if you, for example, use find all markers, and then you have the marker genes of cluster A, and uh, you provide this to the overrepresentation analysis to see what functions these genes are involved in. If you perform um, differential gene expression analysis between two conditions and you use, uh, for example, Lima or HR, in the output of these tools, you will obtain for every gene uh, a, a statistic. So if we compare a phen phenotype A to B, like in this example, we will obtain a T statistic for every single gene, even the non-significant ones. So if we have 20,000 genes in our data set that will be assessed, we will have a T statistic obtained for every single gene. Then what we do is we take our uh, 12,000 genes and we rank them according to their uh, T statistic or fall change, it could also be. So here at the top, we have the genes that have a high fall change for phenotype A. Um, that means they're upregulated in phenotype A. Then you continue and maybe at, in the middle, you have genes that have fall change close or around to zero. So these are the genes that are not differentially expressed between the two conditions. And then at the bottom, you have the genes that have a negative value for the T statistic or the fall change. So these are the genes that are downregulated in phenotype A compared to B. And in the gene set enrichment analysis, what you do is that once you have ranked your list of uh, 12,000 genes, you will walk along this uh, list. And every time you encounter a gene that is part of your gene set S, so gene set S could be a pathway you're interested in. So let's say pathway S. So here you walk along your list. And if the first gene you encounter is part of this gene set, you draw a black, black line. And if it's not part of the gene set, you don't draw anything. So you leave it uh, white. And here we see that if we walk along here, now we encounter uh, two uh, or a few genes that are part of this gene set. So we draw a black, black line. And probably you have seen in uh, publications uh, this sort of uh, chart or uh, series of black lines, which is sometimes called the barcode plot. If you take this uh, little series of black line and you put it uh, horizontally, so this is exactly the same. And um, here you uh, will calculate an enrichment score for that gene set S. This uh, enrichment score actually starts at zero. And then I, as you walk along your list of um, sorted uh, genes, so you have your 12,000 genes here, this um, uh, green curve actually shows the T statistic or the full change value, for example. So here at the top, we have the genes that are upregulated in phenotype A. And then in the middle, we have the genes that have a fold change close to zero. And then finally, the genes that have a negative fold change. So the ones that are downregulated in A. And the enrichment score starts at zero. And every time you encounter a gene that is part of the gene set, the enrichment score increases. And this increase is proportional to the magnitude of this value here. So that's why I was saying that um, the gene set enrichment analysis actually takes into account the magnitude of the fold chains in, that are included in, in your gene set, of these genes that are included in your gene set. So you do this uh, little walk, you increase, and here we encounter many genes that are part of the gene set. So the 
increase is quite rapid. And at some point, um, most of the genes that we encounter are not part of the gene set. So if we don't encounter the gene, the enrichment score decreases again, up to like reaching here um, zero, for example. Then uh, you will determine uh, what is the enrichment score for your uh, gene set of interest S and the enrichment score will be the maximum deviation from zero. So here, let's say we reach 0 0.3, for example. So the enrichment score for my gene set of interest will be uh, 0 0.3. It can, of course, also go down. So if um, the, gene that are, the genes that are part of the gene set are rather um, located at the end of my ranked list, then the enrichment score will start decreasing and going below zero. Because every time I encounter a gene that is not part of the gene set, my enrichment score decreases. And then it could go back up if most of the genes of the gene set are located here. And then my enrichment score will be the maximum deviation from zero, like it could be around here. And in this case, the enrichment score will be negative. So the sign of the enrichment score can tell you if the gene set is upregulated in uh, your condition A, or if the gene set is downregulated in your condition A. So you have an additional information based on the sign of the enrichment score. A last uh, concept of gene set enrichment analysis is what is called the leading edge subset. And the leading edge uh, genes are the genes that most strongly contribute to the enrichment score. And these are the genes that are located uh, before we reach the maximum of the enrichment score. So here we reach the maximum deviation and all the genes that are located here, these ones in, with the black bars are the genes that are the leading edge genes. And this, if you perform an analysis uh, with cluster profiler, you will get the list of these leading edge genes. So maybe just make sure you don't, when you obtain this list of leading edge genes, you don't confuse them with all the genes that are significantly upregulated or not. Because a positive, um, well, a significant enrichment can be found uh, by gene set enrichment analysis for a gene set, even though uh, the individual genes, if you look at them individually, maybe they're not statistically significantly differentially expressed. But the fact that they're all uh, located at like the, the top of the ranked list uh, is enough to have a significant enrichment of that gene set. So that is the advantage of the gene set enrichment analysis compared to overrepresentation analysis is the fact that you can pick up a signal for a gene set, even though at the individual level, the genes are not significant. Um, in cluster profiler, so I don't think we will perform this in the exercise, but if you're interested to perform a gene set enrichment analysis of the Go gene ontology collection, there is the GSE Go function. The uh, important part is that uh, you provide a list of genes. So you have to provide uh, the T statistic or the full change values for all of your genes that you have included in your data set. So if you have 12,000 genes, you have to provide the full change for all of your 12,000 genes because it requires the information also from the non-significant genes to calculate the enrichment score. So, um, and this list of uh, full changes for all of your genes has to be ranked previously manually before you use the function. So remember that you have to do that. The GSC Go function will not rank your full changes uh, automatically. And then you have the GSE keg function. So it's exactly the same principle. It's just to uh, test the keg collection. And finally, if you have your own custom uh, gene sets, so you have your 10 gene sets that you compiled from 10 different publications, you can run GSEA 
of these custom gene sets using the GSEA function. Again, you have to provide your list of fold changes that are ranked. Here, if you're interested in checking how this enrichment score is calculated in detail, you can have the uh, description in this uh, paper here, which is also the paper that um, compiled the Hallmark gene sets that you can find on the MSIGDB um, website. There is a question, which is, is there a Python equivalent for testing user-defined gene sets as with the enricher function? And the honest <laughs> answer is I have no idea. Uh, I will see if I can find something. Um, I never use Python personally, so I don't know, but I'm sure there is. I know there is a package, I have to check. Once I was teaching enrichment analysis, and one of the um, participants uh, told me that they were developing a Python package for visualization of results similar to Revigo, for example. So probably there is, ah, Hert already posted. So good, GSE. I, I just Python. quickly Googled GSE. Oh, yeah, GSE perfect. Python. I was going <laughs> well, to Google already pretty nice. also. <laughs> Great, thank you. Perfect. Yes, if you, if you need info, Google it. Google, Dr. Google has an answer. <laughs> All right, so uh, the VVOX question, I'll do it after the exercises. So if I rem if I forget, remind me to do it. I think that's it for the uh, presentation. As usual, I speak more than I wanted. Let's see. So. Um,